In discussing the wife of Thor, it's important to acknowledge that there's there's a bit of a, a hairy situation to um, to sift through. Sif is a goddess about which we have very little information, and yet there is a vibrant modern practice around her. It's really a shame that there's so little information, as she was likely a very important goddess. Thor, the widely popular deity in the heathen world, especially during the Viking Age, was often referred to in poetry by the kenning the husband of Sif, and Jord, the goddess of the earth. She as well had the kenning the mother-in-law of Sif. These kennings suggest that Sif had a central importance in ancient practice, and that there were likely many more stories around her than the single story that remains. And Sif in this remaining story holds a passive role, so we don't really get to see her do very much, and therefore we do not learn very much about her character. And this makes the other mentions around her as a mystery. So we are left today as heathens practicing the faith in the modern world to construct modern traditions around her, while groping in the dark. The first mention we have of Sif is in the introduction of Snorri's Prose Edda, where Snorri gives a euhemerous narrative of the gods, which means to recast them as humans. Snorri describes Sif as Sibyl, a prophetess who married Thor in his euhemerous narrative. It's unknown how useful this observation is, as it's riddled with contradictions when compared against the myths later told in the same source, by the same person. For example, Snorri is very clear in the rest of the text that Thor is the son of Odin. However, in this narrative, it is Odin who is the grandson by several generations to Thor. The prophetess identity in Snorri's prologue could reveal an aspect of Sif's personality, similar to that of Frigg, Freya, and perhaps Saga, demonstrating a wide tradition of seeresses among the Norse goddesses. However, this is an aspect that could also be Snorri's excuse for why she was considered divine in the first place. As a Christian writer, his perspective might have been that her priestly position, coupled with Thor's royalty as the grandson of the Trojan king Priam of the Iliad, placed her in a later pantheon. Because of this, we should take this iteration of her as a prophetess with a grain of salt, but there may be something there. Now, the only real story of Sif that we have is introduced by Snorri as Bragi explains to Eyr that gold is sometimes called the hair of Sif. Now, we don't have any attestations of this elsewhere, but it comes just after heavily associating gold with fire, perhaps placing Sif as a, a fire goddess of sorts, though this may or may not be related. Personally, I think it's fairly likely that this kinning of gold as the hair of Sif referenced gold that was braided. Imagine a, a noblewoman with a gold bracelet or other jewelry made of braided gold. You might say that her beauty is adorned by the hair of Sif. Again, this isn't attested, as we don't have this kinning anywhere other than Snorri's Skaldskapramol. But if we apply this handbook, this would be a legitimate usage. Long hair was considered a cultural mark of beauty in the Viking Age, and was often covered by married women. There is a story within Njal's saga of Holgerth, known for her beautiful long hair, enticing men one day with her red clothes and perhaps somewhat scandalously exposed hair at the Althing. And despite being twice divorced, and described in the saga as generally disagreeable, her beauty was considered undeniable. Now, this, this isn't even shade towards Holgerth, to be fair. She's quite self-aware over the course of the story. She seems to damn well know that she's hot, and damn well know she's difficult. I'll describe her how she describes herself. She explains at the prospect of remarriage that there aren't many men who would take the risk. And when asked if this was because no man was good enough for her, she says, well, no, it's, it's not that. It was, in her view, more that she's very demanding when it comes to men. Gunnar, one of the uh, main heroes of the saga, and the dog father to Sam, the bestest pupper in the sagas, is stunned by her beauty, and stunned even more when she approaches him and asks him to tell her stories of his adventures. And he says he cannot refuse her. And over the course of their very long, but still their first conversation, 
Gunnar finds himself proposing marriage to Holgerth, even as she takes the time to warn him about her fierce personality. Okay, but I want to warn you, I am very difficult. Okay, but your hair, though. Now, with that understanding of hair's association with beauty, it brings some context to the story of Loki shaving Sif's hair. This is ostensibly robbing her of her beauty, at least in a symbolic sense. Now, this enrages Thor, who holds him responsible and demands that he devise a replacement for her hair. And Loki arranges golden strands to be produced by the dwarves to replace her hair so that her hair would grow as gold naturally thereafter. This story results in the creation of several items along with Sif's hair, such as Odin's spear, Gungnir, and his ring, Dropnir, and Freyr's shining boar, Golimbursti, and his ship, Skidblathnir, which can fold down and fit into his pocket. And finally, Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, which endures to this day as a symbol of our faith. So, something that we can observe is that all of these amazing gifts exist because of Sif. Loki's attack on her is noted. Thor's defense of her honor is noted. But Sif is the reason these gifts are produced at the end of the day. Without Sif, the Thunderer would not have his hammer, the Allfather would be without his spear, and the Lord of Lords, Freyr, would be without his ship and boar. Now, Accusations exist towards Sif of infidelity, but we don't know how credible these accusations are because they're within a dubious context. Perhaps this is a dynamic surrounding Loki's removal of her hair, but this is unclear. Loki holds this to be the case, but in the context of a flighting, where his claims are all over the place, and we don't know how credible his claims are within this context. Some of them we have verified. Some of them we very much don't, and Sif's is among those that we don't have that verification. There's also a second claim to this effect in the poetic Edda from Harbert to Thor, suggesting that Sif has another lover. But this is again in the context of an insult. Harbert's outbursts are all over the place as well, and seem to be geared more towards annoying Thor, so there's not really much we can make of it. These accusations may be in reference to Thor in all his might, being unable to protect his wife, but that's an extrapolation and not explicitly stated. Again, Sif's roles in these stories are quite passive, and it's unfortunate that of the stories that likely existed about her, this is all we have. It even seems, honestly, that she was written out of these stories. The kennings around her suggest an importance that we don't see represented in the available record, which makes me wonder what cultural practices may we be missing that surround her. So, how is Sif to be worshipped? In reference to what? Her place in the Pantheon is unclear. Symbolic references to agricultural association have been inferred between her golden hair and the cycle of harvesting wheat, but this is an inference based on very little actual information. It's not really supported beyond a risky extrapolation. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, it's just good to acknowledge. There's no direct relationship between Sif and agriculture beyond her hair being golden, cut, and replaced. However, this extrapolation has been largely considered reasonable. But there are many fertility gods in this kind of relationship, aren't there? At times it feels like the Norse gods are all fertility, war, or death, which speaks to the lifestyle of the Norse, to be fair. Their lives heavily involved farming, fighting, fucking, and, well fucking off. And Sif may fall into this pattern, and it's likely that she did, but many of the fertility gods are multifaceted, so I feel that having this answer and being satisfied with it may be insufficient. There does seem to be an association between Sif and romantic love. The constant accusations around Sif may be an attempt to actually undermine her place in the pantheon as a goddess associated with married life as many of the insults around the gods seem to have something to do with showing some kind of perceived hypocrisy. 
My personal practice around Sif involves an extrapolation around this concept, which is as a hearth goddess, a guardian of the home. Gold is associated with fire in the Prosetta, and her hair is gold and comes from the fires of a dwarven forge. Sif may then be associated with the warm fire in the home, the fire of the hearth. Her husband is associated with the protection of humanity. It then makes sense to extrapolate Sif as the protector of the home. Through this, uh, my practice around Sif is one around the blessing of the home, and offerings can be made to her for peace in your living space. And when I moved into this house that I'm in now, myself and a few other heathens close to me, including Wolf the Red and Beafeld of Wind in the World Tree, held a house blessing ritual to Sif. The text of this ritual can be found on the Wind in the World Tree's blog, which is linked in the description, and feel free to use this ritual for yourself. Reconstructionism and revivalism both deal with building a spirituality with incomplete puzzle pieces. And in the case of Sif, there's only a few bits of information to go on. But that said, she remains an important goddess to many, including myself. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. The like and subscribe button have moved in together. I'm not making any assumptions, but it's an interesting development. Ring the bell to get notified for more heathen content, and remember to find a way or make one. I just realized I'm releasing this video as I hit 69K. Oh no!